Uh, good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dr. Raymond Waldner will be speaking on the topic of a protein and mitochondrial DNA analysis of a hybrid snapper resulting from a lane snapper with a yellow tail snapper cross. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I, I hope this is a whole lot more interesting than it sounds. Um, I, I came complete with a pointer and everything. I had, I had to fight my cats for this this morning. Um, I won, but they got in their licks. Uh, anyway. I get it. Okay, scratch that. But uh, what? What? Okay. This is the culmination of uh, three years of research. And uh, although my name's on it, um, because I'm giving the presentation, uh, there are actually a number of people who have taken part in this. And this is our primary research team. Uh, the project started with myself and Jessica Pinder. And we did the initial classical ichthyological work and uh, the protein electrophoresis. And then Dr. Toth came on board uh, with two of her students, Marissa Allison and Andrew Taylor, and they did the DNA work. And uh, it's the first time that anyone has taken this kind of multifaceted approach uh, at looking at a fish's biology. So a little bit of history. What led up to this study? When 1860, a Cuban ichthyologist by the name of Felipe Poe decided to put together a multi-volume set called The Natural History of Cuba. And in the second volume, he included descriptions of a number of new species, species that have never before been described to science. Uh, and one of, the, one of the animals he looked at was a new snapper. And he only had one specimen of this snapper. And it was different than any snapper he'd ever seen. And even though he only had one specimen, he described it as a good species. But while doing so, he mentioned a possibility that this fish could be a hybrid. Uh, for the ne Scientists aren't exactly fast sometimes. For the next 132 years, Biologists debated. Okay, some scientists are slower than others. 132 years. Scientists debated about the status of this fish, whether it was a good species or whether it was a hybrid. Uh, no one was really sure until 1992. And a biologist by the name of William Loftus did an extensive study of this fish and found that it, it was a hybrid that was formed by lane snapper mating with the yellowtail snapper. Uh, the same year, just to sort of icing on the cake to confirm this, uh, a couple of biologists by the name of Dumbiron Clark um, took a uh, female lane snapper, bred it with several male uh, yellowtail snappers, and produced mesoprion ambiguous, a fish that later became named as Luke Janus ambiguous showing that this was, in fact, a hybrid. Well, our objective was to take the hybrid and to look at it from a molecular level. That is, look at both the protein makeup and look at the, its uh, mitochondrial DNA and do a comparison with several other snappers and just see how this fish sort of fit in, see what else we could learn about it this way. Um, <laughs> so. What? It, it could happen. Um, so the parents, the parental species. This is a lane snapper. And lane snappers have, have several interesting characteristics. The tail is um, emarginate, just slightly indented, bright red. Dorsal fin is bright red with just a little bit of yellow on the edge. Black spot here and a number of yellow lines going back towards the uh, caudal peduncle, this area of the fish. Um, the other parent is the yellowtail snapper. Notice that the caudal fin is deeply forked. It has a broad, bright yellow line going all the way from the caudal fin up to the eye, and it has these sort of diffuse yellow marks. And if you breed these two together, this is what you come up with. 
This is Luke Janus ambiguous, the hybrid. The tail, the caudal fin, is a little bit more forked than the lane snapper, but not nearly as much as the yellowtail snapper. It's lacking the black dot underneath the dorsal fin. Notice the margin of the tail um, is yellow, but it's red as you come into the body. It has that broad yellow stripe going through the eye, going back to the caudal peduncle, and it also has these more diffuse yellow bands, uh, somewhat like a lane snapper. So it's, it's very intermediate in physical characteristics and morphology. We also chose a couple of other snappers to compare. We looked at this snapper, the gray snapper. Now the gray snapper belongs to the genus Lute Janus, as does the lane snapper, which should mean that the lane snapper and the gray snapper are closer together than any of the other snappers in this study. And then finally, we looked at this fish, uh, the vermilion snapper. Uh, it belongs to a genus Rhomboplites, which is different than any other fish. In fact, this is a monotypic genus. This is the only fish that's placed in this genus. Well, we took a three-prong approach to our research. The first was a comparison of meristics, and meristics are nothing more than countable features. This is classic ichthyology. The second approach was isoelectric focus focusing of um, white muscle proteins. And uh, this has proven to be a very, very effective approach in learning something about the, the genetics and the identification of fishes. And the third approach was looking at uh, the mitochondrial cytochrome B gene. Um, and as, as most of you know, mitochondria are actually symbiotic bacteria that have been inherited from the mother. Um, in almost all species, inheritance of mitochondrial uh, DNA is um, maternal. There, there are some paternal base cases, but it's mostly maternal. So this was, this was the results of our first approach. Um, we chose to look at dorsal spines and rays, anal fin spines and rays, and gill rakers. Um, gill rakers, this is a, this is a gill arch from a fish, and uh, underneath the operculum, there are four sets of gill rakers, uh, functional gill, or four sets of gills, I should say. Um, this is a gill arch, <coughs> and coming off the back of the arch, you see the gill filaments. These are the sites of respiration. And on the front of the gill arch, we have these finger-like projections that are called gill rakers. And the purpose of gill rakers is to stop prey from scooting out underneath the fish's opercle, between his gills and underneath his opercle uh, when, when the fish is feeding. Um, some of these fish are, are plankton feeders. And on plankton feeders, um, you notice here, they have a very high number of gill rakers. And the gill raker is very fine, they're long, and they're closely set. And that helps prevent plankton from getting out. Plankton don't put up much of a fight. Um, so they don't have to be very strong. Um, in some fishes, such as macro predators, feed on crustaceans, feed on fishes like that, the gill rakers are fewer, but they're very stout, very strong. So if a fish bumps against them, it's held in, held in the oral cavity, it can't escape. Well, we looked at the, uh, the dorsal fin spines and rays of our hybrid, and uh, we only had one hybrid to look at, and we compared it with the yellowtail snapper and the lane snapper. And it fits in nicely with either one. It's actually a little bit closer to the yellowtail snapper, Oceurus chrysurus, uh, which usually has 13 um, dorsal uh, rays. And that's exactly what we found in the hybrid. The anal spines are pretty much the same for all of the snappers, all five snappers that we looked at. And the gill rakers match up very nicely uh, with the lane snapper. But the inter interesting thing is, every other researcher who has looked at the hybrid, Lutjanus ambiguous, has found gill rakers that match up with the yellowtail snapper. We have the first fish that's matched up with lane snapper. Um, apparently, the hybrid can inherit this characteristic and possibly others from either parent. It can go either way. 
So there's fl some flexibility there. In fact, some of the coloration and so on in our, our specimen didn't exactly match up with other members of uh, Lucanus ambiguus. Um, so the gill raker is sort of interesting, and this is the first time that this has been shown. The second thing we did was to look at proteins. And this is a polyacrylamide gel. Um, it has a pH gradient. It goes from about pH 5 at this end to pH 8 at this end. And uh, one applies proteins down here by the cathode. And uh, you put electricity through those proteins. We happen to use uh, about 2,000 volts. Um, this is not something you want to put your tongue on. Uh, it will get your attention. Um, under an electric field, the proteins migrate. And in this pH gradient, somewhere along this gradient, they achieve electrical neutrality. And they stop. And a difference of as much as one proton in a protein will allow the proteins to band out separately. So this is, this is a very powerful bio, biochemical technique. And every band you see represents a unique protein. Now, in lane number one and lane number four, we have our hybrid. And you notice the bands all correspond. For every band you have here, you have a band over here. It's a very reproducible technique. In lane number two, we have a yellow tail. And lane number six, we have our lane snapper. These are the two parents. All of the bands that were present in the hybrid are also present in either this parent or this parent, which you, you might expect when you're mating these two parents together and you're coming out with a hybrid. Here we have the vermilion snapper, and over here we have the gray snapper. And notice the vermilion and the gray are, are considerably different. So from a protein basis, obviously, uh, it, it's fairly easy to tell the parents. Um, that matches up very nicely. Um, we needed a way to analyze the electrophoretic data. And there wasn't a good technique available. So we did something new. We took an existing index, something called Sorensen Similarity Index, or the Sorensen coefficient. Uh, this was developed by, amazingly enough, Sorensen in 1948. Um, and this is the index. It's very simple. QS equals 2C over A plus B. Um, if, you can, if you can remember that until you leave the door, I understand you get credit for college algebra. Um, anyway, when Sorensen did this, he developed this index. See, I told you I'd try to make it interesting. <laughs> he developed this index uh, for plant communities. And he said, well, A would be the number of species in community one, and B would be the number of species in community two, and C would be the number of species that were shared between the two communities. And if that value comes out to one, it means you have total similarity. Anything less than one, uh, it's quantitative. It tells you just how much similarity you have. Well, we thought this could be applied. Uh, to electrophoretic data. So instead of looking at plant species and plant communities, we looked at protein bands on an electrophoretic gel. And this is the modification we made. A is the number of proteins that are present on a gel for species one, uh, B, the number of proteins in species two, and C, the number of shared proteins. And it worked out beautifully. And this is a table that we generated using these data. This is similarity. Obviously, a yellowtail snapper and a yellowtail snapper are going to have a similarity of one. Uh, if you look at uh, the two parental species as compared with a hybrid, here's the yellowtail snapper, 82% similarity with a hybrid, and the lane snapper, 81% similarity with a hybrid. So the two parental species are, are both right there. It appears that their contribution, their genetic contribution to the hybrid is about equal. Uh, you notice the gray snapper, uh, Luke Janus griseus. Um, the similarity falls off quite a bit. In fact, uh, rhomboplides, that unique monotypic genus, 
that isn't closely related to anything, supposedly. Okay, so rhomboplides is actually, uh, according to this, slightly more closely related, slightly more similar in protein makeup uh, to the parental species than is Lucanus griseus. And griseus is actually in the same genus as Synagoras. These two are supposed to be the most closely related snappers. And yet, they're, they're quite a bit different. So our third approach was to look at mitochondrial DNA. And this will spin your head, I'm sure. Um, what you're looking at here are nucleotide sequences for the five snappers. We looked at a, a 437 gene sequence of uh, the cytochrome B gene. And we compared each one of these fishes, the sequence in every fish with every other fish. Uh, both Dr. Toth and I did this and compared notes, and uh, it took forever. Um, next time, I hope Dr. Toth generates a somewhat shorter gene sequence <laughs> to, make it, to make it easier to, uh, <laughs> to look at. Uh, we took the information we gathered from that and uh, tabulated. And look at this. This is very interesting. Yellowtail snapper, uh, looking at DNA, mitochondrial DNA, showed about an 80% similarity with the hybrid. The other parent, Synagris, showed about a 55-56% a similarity. That, that, seems, that seems really strange. Um, and uh, Dr. Cardona was one of our internal reviewers, and Dr. Cardona said, well, you know, you've got to remember that mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the mother, only from the mother. Um, when the sperm hits the egg, the mitochondria from the sperm are not transmitted into the egg. And so you would expect there to be a considerable difference between the male and the female, with the female being most similar to the offspring. And in fact, that's exactly what we've got. We were able to tell that the yellowtail snapper, without ever seeing the parents, the yellowtail snapper was a female parent. And Synagoras was the male. Now, Again, look at Griseus. Look at our gray snapper. 24.5% similarity um, with the hybrid. And in fact, looking at Griseus and Synagoras, two fishes of the same genus, 22% similarity. The most, the most diverse fishes we have are the two that are supposed to be the most closely related. That's exactly what the uh, mitochondrial DNA does not show us. It shows us something completely different. Um, we took the data, um, actually using a program that did this for us, um, mitochondrial DNA data, and uh, used it to form a phylogenetic tree for the five snappers. And this is what came out. The hybrid was closest with Oceurus chrysurus, the yellow tail snapper. And this was a maternal parent. Next in line was Lucana sinagris, the paternal parent. Then Rhomboplides or Rubens, that fish that's out by itself in its own genus. And finally, the least closely related is Lucanus griseus. So even though these two uh, fishes are in the same genus, in fact, they are less closely related to each other than this fish is to Oceus chrysurus and Rhomboplides or Rubens, based on these data. So our conclusions. We were able to tell which fish was which parent. And we found that ye the yellowtail snapper, Oceurus chrysurus, was the maternal parent, and Lucana sinagris, the lame snapper, was the paternal parent. 
Both parents' genes were expressed nearly equally in the hybrids' proteins. The number of gill rakers in the hybrid and possibly other characteristics, we didn't look at them, but they can't be ruled out, can be inherited from either parent. We, we have the first specimen that we know the yellowtail snapper was the mother and uh, the uh, lane snapper was the father. In the other ones where the parents were known, it was always uh, the lane snapper that was a mother and the yellowtail snapper was the father. That may have something to do with uh, who inherits what. All the white muscle proteins that were present in the hybrid were also present in at least one of the parental species, showing that, in fact, um, we, we show exactly the same thing that Loftus and uh, Domeyer and Clark showed. Um, we, can, we can say for sure that the lane snapper and the yellowtail snapper were the parental species. And didn't want to do both of those, but we'll do them both together. Uh, the Sorensen Index, as we modified it, turned out to be an extremely useful tool for electrophoretic data, and we think that it will be wide used in future electrophoretic studies. Uh, it's very simple, and it gives you very, very good data. And uh, because of the phylogenetic tree and because of the closeness we saw in both the mitochondrial DNA and the proteins, we think that the yellowtail snapper, which is in the genus Oceurus, and vermilion snapper, which is in genus Rhomboplites, are wrongly classified. The genus of those fish should be changed to the genus. And in fact, this is supported by work done by other researchers as well. Um, they, they are closer to the lane snapper than Lugenus griseus, which is currently placed in, in the same genus. So we've got a number of people to thank for all of this research. Um, the people who caught the fish, first of all, um, Captain Butch Constable Dave Knutson, who was the individual who first started all this. He caught the hybrid, noticed that it was something different, sent it to Sport Fishing Magazine. Sport Fishing Magazine um, contacted me and said, what do you think it is? And uh, I got a hold of Jesse Pinder, who needed one hour to graduate, said, why don't you do a directed study on this? And that's the way that this whole thing began. And Tom Prestia, who is, has a relationship with a, a certain professor in this room. Uh, uh, yes, that's Cynthia's son. And uh, Tom uh, let us use the boat for a day, and we went out and got uh, one of the snappers we were looking for. Uh, Doug Olender, Sport Fishing Magazine, Lot Brothers Bait and Tackle, facilitated our receiving the fish. Chuck Bandy and Barbara Sharp helped us with the uh, preparation of the tables and the figures. And finally, Dr. Suzanne Cardona, Chris Doherty, and Ernest H. Williams from the University of Puerto Rico uh, were our in-house reviewers. And they reviewed um, our work before it went out. Um, we've now submitted to COPIA, which is the world's leading ichthyological journal. Uh, it's passed through the peer review process. We have not gotten word I checked just before we came. Cynthia asked about this about every 10 minutes. We haven't gotten final word from the uh, sectional editor yet uh, that the paper has been accepted. But if, if so, it'll be a, a major paper in Copia. And they have already identified it as a major paper. Uh, so that's it. Yes. Is it common? Did, working with fish to only use, did you say you only used one fish for this whole study? We can only get one hybrid. These, these things are rarer than hen's teeth. But, you know, and one of the problems with that is, in my mind, because I don't know anything about what you're doing. But, well, um, when you're looking at proteins, when you're looking at genetics, yeah. one specimen is pretty yeah. standard. Oh, that's what I was asking. Oh, yeah. yeah. No. You can't do statistics on it with what you did to know if any of those figures are really... No, well, when, when you're working with proteins and when you're working with DNA, uh, the similarity is such that one specimen is all you need. Yeah. If, if you are looking at um, behavior or any other ecological characteristic or something like that, yeah. um, you'd be laughed off, the, you know, laughed off the board with one specimen. So if you took a fish from Florida Bay, a gray snap from Florida Bay, and one from, say, Chasawitska, and you did the same analysis, and so I'm the similarity index of one? Yeah. You'd find, you'd find that they were, they were quite similar. 
Uh, you'd probably find a little bit of individual Close variation, point. but if you took two fish from the same population, you're still going to find yeah. that. Yeah, if you're from the same population, yeah. I can see that. Yeah, but you're still you're still going to see that. Okay. Well, Ray, I have one more question. How um, how much of the uh, fish taxonomy do you think is messed up? And I'm only saying that because <laughs> mollusk <laughs> mollusk taxonomy is doing the same thing. They, they look at things and they say okay. oh, they're in the same genus. It's a mess. There's a paper that came out in 2012 that totally rewrote um, the, the higher phylogeny of fishes. Um, and it was the first major paper that looked at everything from the standpoint of DNA. Um, and it, it rewrote everything that I learned as a student. And I've had to go back and revise. Uh, you know, I, I, I pity my poor ichthyology students. Because um, the the new taxonomy it's 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 wild, and I'm having to relearn everything. Um, so it's changed tremendously. But you know, DNA is just a tool. Uh, you use it with everything else. Um, until people had an idea of the the genetic similarity, a molecular similarity of organisms, all they had to go by were physical characteristics. Where does that and, come from? Um, all of those fishes came from offshore of Jupiter. Okay, because here's, here's another Well, all except for one. All except for one grain snapper. You can have the same species on the east coast of Florida and the west coast of Florida, and guess what? They don't look like the same thing, but they're the same species. So I was wondering if you caught a hybrid on the west coast of Florida, might it have different um, DNA or protein characteristics? Yeah, but they're, it, it, it's still going to come from the same parent's parental species. So it has more to do with what, like what Tom was talking with a variation of parental species yeah. in different locales. And in fact, our hybrid was the only one, the first one that's been taken in this area, and it was different from the other hybrids. You could see that in the gill rakers. Yeah. But that could be a, uh, an effect of who was a maternal parent and who was a paternal parent. You could have some differences based on the locale where you, where you catch the fish. But those are small epigenetic changes, perhaps, and actually we're looking at that. Where that's going to be the next phase of our research where we're looking at so yeah, epigenetic What an interesting thing. Matt? Awesome. How many times did you have to go out, or how many fish did you catch during the day before you found the uh, well, one? We, we, we never got a hybrid. Mm -hmm. oh. this, this fellow was commercial hook and line fishing off of Jupiter, and he was he was catching lane snappers, he was catching yellowtail, and he was actually actually catching vermilions. And then he caught this one fish that was different from everything else he caught. And uh, that turned out to be the hybrid. So it was it was sheer luck. It's the only hybrid I've ever seen. The only hybrid of these species I've ever come across. Uh, there, there are only about a dozen that have ever been reported. So they're they're quite rare. Thanks, I know.